Often when you hear an agency talk about their client, it's like Batman and Robin. The agency is Batman. He's the kind of hero. <laughs> yeah. You know, the client is almost like the sidekick, sometimes getting in the way. The analogy that I like to talk about instead is how about Avengers Assemble? That we together put together a team of superheroes and achieve some things that we couldn't do on our own. And I think it would help designers with talking about great clients. And if a designer talks about the difference that it makes to the work because the client was amazing, then other clients will want to behave like that. Packaging design should seduce, inform, and even save the planet. I'm Hernan Raberman, and this is Branderman, the podcast where I talk with experts to uncover what it actually takes to make a positive impact on consumers, the market, and society. Warning, keep this podcast out of the reach of close-minded marketers and designers. Before the interview, let me introduce my design agency. Brands with purpose. Human, agile, honest brands that leave no one indifferent. Tridimage creates and revitalizes brands to imagine and shape the future. Tridimage, the branding and packaging design agency for bold brands. Today I had the pleasure to speak with Jeremy Lindley, Global Design Director at Diageo the world's leading premium drink business. Jeremy is responsible for transforming the design capability and output of Diageo current brands and new products worldwide. He's passionate about the impact design has on business performance and the way design thinking leads to breakthrough ideas wherever it is applied. Jeremy's standout projects include Johnny Walker Blue Label, Tanqueray 10 and the Johnny Walker brand home in Edinburgh. In this episode, we talk about the revolution of inclusive design that leads to better work and improved business outcomes. Jeremy explains why, by including those previously excluded from the creative industry, we will see an explosion of creativity. He also shares what are the biggest mistakes brands make when redesigning their brands and packaging. Today with me, Jeremy Lindley. Jeremy, each of us is a container of ideas, projects, and dreams. However, we can't read the label when we are inside the jar. What do you think your label says, or what would you like it to say? I think I can answer the question. And the reason is I'm, I'm a really big advocate of purpose, both in terms of how it relates to brands, you know, for brands to have a really clear higher order purpose, but also individually. I think it's really powerful if we can spend the time and be introspective enough to really think about, okay, what is my personal purpose? What is it that I get out of bed every day to do? So I, I've had the opportunity to do that. I love helping other people and sort of coaching and mentoring other people to find out their personal purpose. So I think the label on my jar would be the way I describe my purpose, which is to bring faith and action. Part of it just reflects my own personal belief system. I am a Christian. It means I have faith. But also what I find is in work, in life, I have faith for things to be better. I am a designer, I'm a creative, I'm an ideas person. I have faith in the design process, that we start a process not knowing what the answer is and that we can find the answer, we can make things better. So I'm an ideas and kind of inspiration guy, I suppose you could say. But more than that, I am someone that likes to and has capability to put that into action. So as well as believing in a better future or, or having ideas, that I think can really change things. I know I've got the capability to pragmatically plan and kind of deliver those. So I think my label, hopefully beautifully designed on the outside of the jar, um, <laughs> would have those two words there, faith and action. <laughs> That sounds beautiful. <laughs> Building a brand is like a journey. It starts with defining where we are and asking ourselves where we want to go. What was the path that led you from studying industrial and product design to directing the global design vision at Diacho, the world's leading premium drinks business? 
I think it was really identifying my strengths and what I was particularly good at. So I, I decided I wanted to be a designer when I was 17 years old. I watched a documentary about Ettore Sotsas. Mm-hmm. And I just remember thinking, I'd like to do that. I'm eternally grateful to my 17-year-old self. He made a really good decision. <laughs> it's a fantastic profession. I absolutely love it. Then I worked freelance for a number of years. And, you know, sense was I'm a good designer. I was very happy with my, you know, kind of capability in design. But I was sort of looking and thinking, where is it that I think I might be better than my peers? You know, where is my superpower? Mm. And what I noticed was, I thought I was very good at identifying what the real problem was, which often wasn't the original problem that maybe the client was presenting us. I could really think through design strategy, and I seemed to have an ability to influence others, to spot great ideas. So what I felt was I might be better client side than agency side. So I moved from working freelance, I joined Tesco in the the design team there, and I loved it. And then when I was approached with the opportunity to lead design at Diageo, it was a very easy decision, actually, because it's a a remarkable company that the culture in the organization is one that I have a real deep affinity with, one where diversity and inclusion is really valued. But the brands as well, you just look in on this portfolio of brands, you know, many that I would look in from a design perspective and really deeply admire brands like Guinness, you know, kind of Johnny Walker, the the rich (laughs) visual history that they had. Some of these brands, it's a sort of 200-year journey of investing in great design. I thought, I just want to be a little bit of a, a part of that. So I have a team of 10. It's not a sort of traditional in-house design team, I suppose you could say. And I describe it as a design leadership team. So we don't do any of the design work in-house within Diageo. We have chosen to work with external agencies. The reason for that is in our particular category, I actually think we would struggle to get the best creatives to come and work for us internally. So my job is find the world's best designers and then motivate them to work with Diageo, do the very best work of their lives. At Diageo, I've been really blessed to grow the role of design. So it's a lot more than just packaging design now. It's really at Diageo how we think about the whole interaction between the brand and the consumer. So very much thinking about Mm. visual identity, how the brand is presented in retail, in bars. Diageo did a £185 million investment in whiskey tourism in Scotland. So we were able to lead the design work on all of those kind of consumer experiences for the different distilleries, but also then for the £85 million Johnny Walker Princess Street brand home. Wow. And what do you understand about design now from inside a huge corporation that you didn't understand before when you were on the agency side? I think it's really the strategic role of design within an organization, how design thinking can help a business more broadly. So it's very exciting to be involved in things outside of just design projects. We've got design very sort of deeply embedded in innovation, in marketing, in the thought processes. So I guess those two things really, one is how much more design can offer than just design. But then it's that kind of very broad strategic role, how design integrates into, and then often in many cases can lead the strategic thinking of an organization. Do you meet something from the design consultant life? Nope. (laughs) I don't (laughs) think I do, actually. Um, Look, I had a good time. I really enjoyed it. It was a you know, fantastic learning opportunity. Socially, it's great fun. I don't think I miss it at all, honestly. I love being deeply involved in business strategy. I love being able to be involved, contribute, lead outside of just design. What does it take to build a design culture inside a large company? How do you manage to deeply embed design into the organization? It does take time and patience. For most organizations that design leaders are working in, they're not necessarily ones with a long history of design. So it takes time. I think you do need to be patient with it. It does require senior sponsorship, so you can't do Mm. it on your own. So I'm really grateful I've got the the sponsorship of the chief marketing officer and the chief executive. And more broadly, I know the exec behind me and my colleagues on the marketing leadership team. There's a lot of education to do. People just don't know about design. Many people, when they think about design, will just think about the very end of the process, the sort of styling side of things. I do think it's really important to speak the language of business. So to talk to effectiveness, design as being a key driver of business growth so that people can kind of get, this is not just the precious creatives sitting in the corner talking about beauty. 
I talk the language of business and other people understand and then can see demonstrable proof that investing in design leads to enhanced growth. I, I spend a lot of time explaining and educating, talk about how the brain works, about recognition, about the impact that sort of beauty has. But little by little, it can deeply seep into the culture and fabric of the organization. Fantastic. How do you measure design effectiveness and the impact of your work? The same way that we do with all our marketing. Diageo's got a very sophisticated system for measuring marketing effectiveness. We look at both short and long-term, short-term sales drivers, but also the long-term brand building impact of our activities. I'm a big advocate of the Design Business Association's Design Effectiveness Awards. I, I love a number of design awards. Look, you'll, you'll hear me advocate for Pent Awards and DNAD pencils and such like as well. I value the Design Effectiveness Award because you've got an independent panel of judges, most of whom are business leaders, looking at your case study and saying, have they managed to conclusively prove that it was only design that did this? It's really, really hard to win one. So I'm very proud that Diageo is the most awarded client ever on those awards that a couple of years ago we won the Grand Prix because that kind of scrutiny of going, people externally looking at my case study and judging, did it really make the difference? It is something I value greatly. Jeremy, what is your favorite current habit? I think it's persistence. To be a designer and be a design leader, you need to have persistence and persuade other people to do that, you don't necessarily land it the first time. So the yeah. first presentation from an agency isn't necessarily right. Sometimes you'll go through the design process, you'll get into research, and it will, in inverted commas, fail. There's really no such thing as failure in design. There's just learning. But kind of saying to people, okay, we're further on now because we've learned something and we've learned a lot of things that haven't worked. But also not settling. It sometimes drives the designers I work with around the bend, but hopefully eventually they'll, they'll, they're grateful to me for it. <laughs> which is like, okay, no, this is quite a good idea. And there's three or four here, but it's just, we're not there yet. I need you to push further. So it's that kind of sense of persistence of going, we absolutely can and need and will get to genius. At the Pentawars Festival, you stated that design is our next frontier for progressive marketing. Can you share an overview of the four key themes you share in your keynote? Progressive marketing is part of Diageo's overall belief that a diverse business is a better business. We believe marketing can have a really key role in shaping culture for the better. We've kind of thought about this in four ways. So representation, that's thinking about who is being portrayed. We really want to celebrate difference. One of the implications for that in design is we really think that the people that are our sort of target market should influence the products or the means of production. So that's something we're very much asking our design agencies to do at the moment is say, look, can you make sure that the design team is genuinely reflective of the target market? Second there is perspective. So that's whose point of view is the work coming from? Mm. So there's certain things we need to just avoid. We have to avoid the male gaze. You know, there's more subtle things like the colonial gaze. So it's a sort of point of view of kind of Westerners of the rest of the world. If we actually get the perspective of the people that we're representing from them, then I think it's going to be a much more kind of inclusive and diverse world. The third is agency. So thinking about how people interact and behave in our work, you know, very much thinking about how can we incorporate the needs of the marginalized. And that's one of the core tenets of inclusive design. You do that and actually it makes the work better for all of us. And then in characterization, it's characterizing, portraying real people. So one of the examples I sometimes use is I think there's a trap that we can fall into in, in categories like ours as and others that really value kind of craftsmanship and expertise. And we yeah. can portray an individual as being wholly dedicated to their craft. <laughs> Often when that's portrayed, it's portrayed as being a man. Yeah. You know, the implication there is you need to sacrifice all other areas of your life in order to become dedicated and an expert at this. So we're kind of reinforcing gender stereotypes impact on family life. The reality is none of these things come about by an individual. It's teamwork that, yeah. that's for amazing quality products and craftsmanship. And if we portray teamwork, we're going to portray a lot more diversity and a much more kind of realistic version of a balanced life. If a Western-centric view of good design is not universal, as you said, 
how can global brands consider other perspectives to connect with international consumers? We have to listen. We have to research. Probably most importantly, we have to work with people from other cultures. We're asking our agencies to ensure that the project team reflects the target market. Get out the office, listen, learn, don't assume you're right. Spread the work to the people that have inspired it. So one of the principles we're trying to implement is that the culture that inspires the work benefits from the production of it. So rather than a designer in London imagining that they know how to represent Kenyan culture, for example, yeah. actually, if it's inspired by a culture in Kenya, let's have a Kenyan artist based in Kenya doing the work. So I just think we have to get out of the office, listen, learn, and work with the people that we're seeking to sell to. Can you share with our audience the Acho's inclusive package design principles? We're early in this journey. We have set some principles around inclusive pack design. First, really important thing that we learned is actually the bottle still has to be a work of art. So when we talk to disabled consumers, they said to us, look, don't make it ugly. You know, actually, we want to relax, socialize, feel like we're part of the group. And everything that's involved in a great night out, in premium alcohol, in beautiful bottles, in lovely serves, we want that as well. But don't go making this ugly, please. Think about the whole experience. They ask for things like gripping bottles can be quite hard. So one of our principles yeah. is build in clever ways that bottles can be gripped, reducing the torque that's needed to open caps, because actually hand and grip, it happens to all of us as we get older. And then integrating. So whenever we do something to make a design better, don't make it that you have to buy something separate or it's a separate aid. It's to integrate everything. The final kind of principle is to really think about weight. Light weighting is beneficial, but also weight distribution as well. So those are the principles we're right at the start of implementing. What do you know today about inclusive design that you wish you had known years ago? I think it's some of the sort of inadvertent traps that I've fallen into. In some areas, it's called unconscious bias where I'm not deliberately or kind of consciously biased against any group, yet all of us struggle to genuinely understand the needs of others because it's not our lived experience. I wish that I had known that I, in common with most of us, have a level of unconscious bias. And as a consequence, that would have caused me to work a lot harder to kind of reach out, learn and understand and gain a real sense of perspective from others. There is power in diversity. Great skill is required to bring about inclusion. Design succeeds when we develop empathy. When we do this well, with humility and inclusion, the payoffs can be significant. What is your best tip for making the world of package design a better place? Work with and deeply understand the people that you're designing for. Have humility, listen, deeply understand, work with, and preferably commission the people that you're seeking to design for. Talking about the client-agency relationship, is there a better way for in-house teams to work with external agencies? It all starts with respect, appreciating, understanding the strengths of each other's. That goes both ways. One of the things that frustrates me is when I hear designers talking scathingly about their clients. It's just deeply unacceptable. Sometimes it's direct. Sometimes you hear a kind of inference, which is, oh, the client's an idiot. The client chose the wrong solution. The <laughs> client messed it up. So you will never have a great relationship with your client if you talk about them in that way. What I encourage designers to do, actually, is to highlight the stories of great clients. So one of the quotes I like using is a David Ogilvy quote, and he said, clients get the work they deserve. He was responding to a question, which was, how come the quality of work from your agency varies? And he was basically going, well, it's down to the client. So his perspective was, look, if I've got a client that really trusts me, that invests enough in me to share their full strategy with me, who trusts and appreciates my people, who pays their bills on time, me and all of my team will love that client and we will work our socks off for them. <laughs> we'll probably be dreaming about the projects and we'll think of a great idea in the shower. Now, if you've got a client who doesn't share the full strategy, changes their mind, pays late, is rude and dismissive, However much we want to satisfy that client, it's just hard to do it. My goal always 
is to have a great relationship with the agencies and the individuals that I work with. I want to make the agency better as a result of working for me. So my aim is always very best work in the agency's portfolio is the Diageo work. I want <laughs> them to get more work as a result of working with me. Often when you hear an agency talk about their client, it's like Batman and Robin. The agency is Batman. He's the kind of hero. <laughs> yeah. You know, the client is almost like the sidekick, sometimes getting in the way. The analogy that I like to talk about instead is how about Avengers Assemble, that we together put together a team of superheroes that are just going to nail this and achieve some things that we couldn't do on our own. And I think it would help designers with talking about great clients. And if a designer talks about the difference that it makes to the work because the client was amazing, then other clients will want to behave like that. Inspiring, Jeremy. Thank you. Working on brands such as Guinness, Johnny Walker, Bailey's, Smirnoff, how do you balance their rich visual history with their progressive future? It's probably the most exciting part of my job because I get to work on brands with an amazing heritage of design, but also to think about their future. It's what, one of the things that excites me the most. So the first thing I do is I deeply understand the brand, the history and the strategy of the brand the memory structures that consumers have got around it. What are the assets that just consumers will instantly recognize? I describe it as the visual thread. So on nearly every brand, there has been some sort of creative directional visual thread through its history. You can always find anomalies, but you can kind of find this consistent pattern the brand has kind of come back to many times. It then gives you that kind of basis of which to sort of bounce kind of really. That helps me know what needs to be consistent where there's the kind of stretch and the sort of flex so that we can really kind of play with something that definitely consumers will recognize, but also, you know, what's the new and the kind of exciting? Guinness is an amazing kind of rich brand, but it's got that strong visual thread, both in its kind of colorways in terms of the black and white, but also the visual style that it's worked to, the richness, the complexity, the way that the sort of pour and surge and settle of the liquid has so often been used visually. Then you can go, okay, what's a contemporary reinterpretation of that? What new elements can we bring in while still making it recognizable? So as I said, it's probably the most fun part of our job. Yeah. And what is the biggest mistake you see brands make when redesigning their package or their brands? It's not understanding their visual history and what makes them recognizable. And as a consequence, throwing things away. It's like vandalism. It's as if you, you know, <laughs> you've got this beautiful, amazing kind of historic house. Maybe it's a little tired. The floor is all scuffed up. The plaster is kind of peeling. It's like knocking that house down and just putting a prefabricated block on top of it <laughs> versus going, no, 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 this house is beautiful, but I need to restructure it slightly. So I'm going to replaster. I'm going to take this wall down so that it works for my family life now. I'm going to extend it out the back so that we can live more. But you respect and build on the existing house. So it's just the vandalism to throw assets away, chase after what's in inverted commas often called modernity. So mm -hmm. when people like radically simplify things and lose all of the, the sort of visual history, it's a real shame. Yeah. Great analogy, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. What's the biggest design challenge you have faced so far at the Diacho and how did you overcome it? The project itself was called Destination Scotland. The board gave us £185 million pounds to invest in whisky tourism in Scotland. This was a new design capability we had to mm. sort of instantly build. So we did a lot of work on the brand homes that were at the distilleries. That was kind of very interesting. So £85 million pounds spent on developing a brand home for Johnny Walker on Princess Street in Edinburgh. And what's challenging there is there isn't a distillery or production facility that's a basic round. So when oh. you look at most brand homes, it's because that's where the brand's made or where, yeah. that's where the kind of brand's history is. So for us, we wanted to build it in Edinburgh. We wanted it's the world's biggest Scotch whiskey, Johnny Walker. Yeah. And the majority of visitors that come to Scotland go to only Edinburgh. So we wanted those people to have the opportunity to experience the brand in Edinburgh, but we had to start from scratch. That's a really big design challenge. The way we went about it was getting very clear about the strategy, what aspects of the brand we wanted to bring to life, what type of attraction we needed to make, create something that was really exciting and enticing for visitors to come and visit. Because effectively, people are either a, a local or you're a tourist. You know, you're going to spend 25, 30 pounds, yeah. sort of hour and a half, two hour of your day 
it's got to be amazing. <laughs> and they don't want to pay us for us to market the brand to them. They're paying us to be genuinely entertained and enticed and, and surprised and delighted. <laughs> What is the tactic that has worked for you time and time again, your secret weapon? My secret weapon is to trust the design process, not to settle, to just focus on what is right for this. I'm going to find what's right for this brand, for this problem, for this opportunity, but not to compromise, not to accept a sort of halfway there solution, but only settle when it's absolutely the very best that it can be. Where do you feel you have a different opinion than most of your colleagues? <laughs> the, the sort of case study that I could pick out here, I find I disagree with most designers on this. Many years ago, a company redesigned Hovis bread packaging, and they took off the kind of history and the heritage and the recognizable aspects of Hovis, and they put slices of cucumber and baked beans on the packaging. Every designer I, I talk to has it in their top 10 of the best pieces of design. I think it's the worst piece of design I've ever <laughs> seen. Part of the reason for that is it didn't last very long. The mm. brand took that off and went back to how they'd always look. This is a brand in the UK that's all about wholesomeness, the sort of goodness of bread. And that you know, sort of metaphor of going, oh, here's what you might put on your bread. Firstly, it was confusing to consumers because they could no longer work out which was the thin and which was the thick slice. Secondly, the joke wore thin incredibly quickly. And thirdly, it, most importantly, it sacrificed heritage and recognition. And as a consequence, it didn't last long. But it sits in designers' mind as this genius that an idiotic <laughs> client got rid of. And I actually think the, the client was wrong to do it in the first place, but right to get rid of it quickly. That was actual design vandalism. To me, it's vandalism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy, now I propose we play a game. As you know, a ping pong table is a must in many creative studios. So I will make you a series of brief questions and you have to choose one or another concept. Are you ready for Brandersman ping pong? Let's go for it. <laughs> I am a designer or I am a consultant? I'm a designer. It's been a fair while since I've done the design work myself. I've led design for many years, but when people ask me what I do, I say I'm a designer. And it's because I deeply value the thought process and the disciplines of design. And therefore, I would always think of myself as a designer. <laughs> Close brief or open-ended brief? Close brief, I think I quite often describe the freedom of a tight brief. I think it's really important as a client to be specific and mm. to have done the strategic thinking. Now, having said that, I always want to be open to my agency going, like, can we just talk about this? I'm not 100% sure. And I also want to be open to learning through the process. There are times in the design process where you need to pause and go, hang on, we've written the long brief. But I would always want to do the strategic thinking and to land the problem or the opportunity very tightly for people to then run it. Uh, Einstein said a well-defined brief is 95% solved. And I agree with him. Creative strategist or strategic designer? I'm going to go creative strategist because I do think design is a much bigger opportunity than it's often portrayed as being. Creation project or a redesign project? I think everything's a creation project. So even if you're redesigning something, it's a rebirth in my mind. Focus groups or gut feelings? <laughs> hate both, but I really deeply value research. Focus groups are one of the worst ways of researching something, and they're what gives <laughs> research a bad name. But very, very few of us are right in terms of our gut reaction. We need the humility to learn. So I hate focus groups, but <laughs> I love research. What I want to get to is the implicit response of consumers problem with the focus group is one gobby person will say something and then everyone else follows suit. Um, yeah. As soon as opinion has been expressed, what everyone else says is in some way influenced that by that opinion. So monadic first show response is the only thing that's interesting. Mass market or premium market? I'm going to have to say premium market. That's the area that I work in and that I love. And actually, for most of our products that we work with, the price point they're at, they're special. People will enjoy them, they'll save them, they'll save up for them. It's a treat. 
the care and attention I try and apply to our products, whatever the price point. This is someone's Friday night, relax with their friends. End of a tough day. It's been really hard getting the kids down to bed. <laughs> Just going to have a gin and tonic. That moment is very premium and special for people. Conceptualization or execution? Oh, I'm going to go both because you can't have one without the other. Great concepts are really, really critical, but they're nothing if they're not executed. So I'm constantly talking to my team about both. So we're right there at the start of the process and inspiring and searching for the best idea. But we also go on the proofing run. And I've spent a lot of time in glass foundries, which are really hot, by the way. But just making sure that we've absolutely got all of the detail and the color and the nuance right on the first run of the packaging. Graphics or a structure? Hey, it's another both, really. Because if you do the structure first and then apply the graphics to it, you'll fail. They have to be deeply integrated. Design's holistic. You have to do both at the same time. Form follows function or forms follow emotion? Well, I'm going to go form follows function, but I'm going to caveat by saying the emotional response is one of the most important ones. Uh, leading designers or continuing to design all your life? Uh, leading designers. So I made that decision a long time ago and I love it. I don't regret it at all. <laughs> remote work or face-to-face -face work? Face-to-face -face work. Look, remote work is important. We've made it work through the pandemic. You know, we have a flexible working policy at Diageo. I spend half my day on Zoom and we make all of that work. But in design, there's something really important and special about physically being together, working ideas and bouncing off each other and just seeing the nuance in someone's reaction. And finally, great designers are born or great designers are made? Great designers are made. I believe there's creativity in all of us. It really saddens me that still even now in the education system, people get put off the creative world. There's amazing creativity in kids and it kind of gets rammed out of them through the education process. So I think it's there in all of us. We have a responsibility to try and change our education system and try and help our kids to recognize that they can be creative through their whole life. Jeremy, how do we design brand packaging for a sustainable tomorrow? Design's got to be right at the heart of us getting to net carbon zero. It's going to take our best designers and our best design thinking to get us there. We committed to a 50% reduction in our scope three carbon emissions by 2030. We don't yet know how we're going to get there. So that's a target that we've set and we're in the process of designing how we're going to get there. In the industry that I work in, we're 95% in glass. So we are going to mm. need to find some alternative materials to glass. It's beautiful. It lasts forever. It's high in its carbon usage. We're also going to need to do radical lightweight uh, of all of the materials that we use. Design is going to have to lead the revolution of reuse. Recycling isn't the answer. It's obviously important and better than using virgin materials. But design is going to have to really help us get to great, simple, circular models. How do we make it really easy for consumers to use things more than once? How do we make it compelling, exciting, and fun? So it's a big challenge, and I'm excited because design is going to be at the heart of solving this. And what are you optimistic about, and what are you afraid of? I'm optimistic about the sort of research and development and the efforts that we're making and that everyone's making in this area. I worry about how we're going to bring about a change in consumer because it's all very well, you know, us doing work at the sort of manufacturing and end of things. But a change is going to require a change in consumer behavior. If you look at the levels of recycling that happen at the moment, they're still very, very low. What are those ways that we can bring about a change in consumer behavior? Because it's going to require that as well. If you could have a magic wand and fix two or three things in the design industry, that would help you sleep better at night. What would that look like? There's a talent shortage in design at the moment. And I know a lot of people are really struggling to recruit the right talent. So I'd love a magic wand to solve that. Related to that, we have a diversity issue design. So whatever survey you look at, and there's a lot of organizations that have surveyed the world of design, we've got a diversity issue. That's a justice problem in my mind. It's just not right that our industry isn't open to very broad, diverse people that live in our society. If we can really work very hard on drawing in and enabling 
much more diverse group of people to enter the design industry, then hey, presto, doesn't that help us with our talent shortage as well? I would love to, if there was some sort of apprentice scheme Mm. for design. At the moment, in most countries around the world, the model is you go to university. There are a lot of people who both financially and culturally find that very, very difficult to do. There's amazing talent out there. So Diageo, together with Google and Adidas, have sponsored DNAD Shift, which is a program that seeks to bring people without a university education, but with a lot of talent into the design world. We're missing a talent pool. I would really love to help a much broader group of people come into our industry. Fantastic. What do you predict will emerge in the packaging design space in 10 or 20 years from now? And how do you imagine the term packaging design will evolve? The term packaging design might disappear. Because wow. I think the way that consumers think about how goods are sort of transported and protected and used might change. I've got a feeling that actually some really radical new materials are going to emerge from all of the R&D that's going on around sustainability at the moment. As different materials and kind of circular models integrate, I just wonder if we'll even talk about packaging design anymore and whether we're thinking about delivery systems, sort of usage systems instead. Wow. What do you want to learn that you don't know yet? I really want to learn more about different cultures, the creativity that they offer. Just yesterday, we had the DNAD Shift students in Diageo presenting on a project that we had given to them around one of our brands. It was so inspiring. It was so eye-opening to hear their perspective from kind of different backgrounds and kind of different start points. So I just want to continue to immerse myself in perspectives and cultures that are different to mine, lived experiences that are different to mine. I think it's just so enriching. Jeremy, what is the most important thing on your to-do list for your professional life? What's your next adventure? One is inclusive design. I really want to make a difference to include people that have previously been excluded from our amazing industry. Second is sustainability. I'm committed to making a really significant contribution towards the net zero goals. It's why it's exciting to work at Diageo. It is a business with real heart, but also real scale. We can lead the industry and leave a kind of legacy that makes a real difference. Jeremy, thanks for this super inspiring talk and for actually driving design in ways that celebrates consumers' physical, mental and cultural differences, making brands accessible and relatable to everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks. It's been a real pleasure. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. You can check the episode notes for all the relevant links. I also invite you to follow me on Instagram and on my website, branderman.design. Follow the podcast in your favorite app so you don't miss the next episode of Branderman, the podcast where we try to uncover how to make a positive impact on consumers, the market and society through package design.